Welcome to another instructional video from OWL, the wise choice in fiber optic test equipment. I'm Professor Jim Powers. One of the key concepts to understand when evaluating, comparing, or using OTDRs is the concept of a dead zone. During OTDR measurements, dead zones are a limiting factor, so it is important to minimize the effects of dead zones wherever possible. This video will attempt to explain what a dead zone is, the effects of dead zones on OTDR measurements, as well as an OTDR launch cable used to counter the effects of an OTDR's dead zone on OTDR measurements. In regards to OTDR testing, a dead zone can be loosely defined as the inability of an OTDR to detect or measure a particular event that closely follows a previous event. For best results, it is important to minimize the length of the dead zone as much as possible. The shorter the dead zone, the closer events can be and still be able to tell them apart. There are two different factors that contribute to the overall dead zone of a particular OTDR test, pulse width and OTDR related dead zones. The first factor is pulse width, which is one of the variable settings in an OTDR. Pulse width refers to the duration of each OTDR laser pulse. During OTDR measurements, the OTDR is effectively blinded for a period of time equal to the width of the pulse. Consider this helpful analogy. If someone shines a flashlight in our eye for one second, our eye will be blinded for a second before it can begin to recover enough to see detail. We can then conclude that if the flashlight is on for 10 seconds, our eye cannot begin recovery until after 10 seconds has passed. For best results, the pulse width setting should be as short as possible while still keeping the end of the OTDR trace sufficiently above the noise level of the OTDR trace to prevent the noise from creating false events. Obviously, it goes without saying that longer fibers may require longer pulse widths. Depending upon manufacturer, pulse width settings can either be given as time in nanoseconds or microseconds, or in distance in meters. To convert time-based pulse widths to distance, the conversion factor is roughly 10 nanoseconds per meter. The second factor is the OTDR-related dead zone, of which there are two types, event dead zone and attenuation dead zone. OTDR manufacturers include these specifications on their OTDR data sheets, expressed as distance in meters. Event dead zone is used when the technician is simply trying to determine the individual location of two or more closely spaced events. Any trailing events within the event dead zone of the first event, especially if the first event has saturated the OTDR's avalanche photodiode or APD, may appear to the OTDR as a single, albeit wider, event, or may appear as a stair step also referred to as a multiple reflective event. Attenuation dead zone, on the other hand, is used when trying to individually measure closely spaced events. To do so, there must be sufficient backscatter between the events to allow the cursors to be placed on backscatter both before and after the event being measured. Because of this, attenuation dead zone will always be longer than the event dead zone. Thus, the overall event dead zone for a particular OTDR test is calculated as pulse width in meters plus event dead zone in meters. While the overall attenuation dead zone for a particular OTDR test is calculated as pulse width in meters plus the attenuation dead zone in meters. To counter the effect of OTDR dead zones, a long segment of optical fiber called an OTDR launch cable must be inserted between the OTDR and the link under test. OTDR launch cables have different names in the fiber optics industry, such as dead zone box, fiber ring, or pulse suppressor, but for ease of understanding, just think of an OTDR launch cable as simply an extremely long patch cable. As a general rule of thumb, the minimum length of an OTDR launch cable must be more than twice as long as the overall dead zone. Although OTDR manufacturers generally recommend a minimum launch cable length of 25 meters, even for the shortest pulse widths. However, since OTDR dead zones vary with pulse width, most launch cables are long enough to accommodate a wide range of commonly used pulse widths. As such, multi-mode OTDR launch cables are typically a minimum of 150 meters, while single-mode launch cables can be up to 500 meters or more. 
OTDR launch cables perform two key functions. First, OTDR launch cables allow the OTDR's avalanche photodiode to recover from the reflection caused by the OTDR port, so that the dead zone caused by the OTDR port can be sufficiently isolated from the dead zone caused by the connection at the near end of the fiber under test. Second, OTDR launch cables introduce backscatter before the near end patch panel so that the loss and or reflectance of the near end patch panel can be measured. As an option, a second identical launch cable, commonly called a landing cable, can be attached to the far end of the fiber link. This landing cable provides the necessary backscatter that allows the technician to measure the loss and reflectance of the far end connection as well. As we have just learned, OTDR launch cables are a necessity for proper OTDR test results, just as reference patch cables are necessary for proper optical loss measurement and fiber link certification. As such, since OTDR launch cables are essentially extremely long patch cables, they are subject to the same types of durability issues. If handled with proper care, normal wear and tear should allow several hundred connector insertions. However, if the OTDR launch cable is not handled properly, mishandling could break the fragile optical fiber and poor cleaning procedure could cause end face damage such as scratches or pits. Cost is another issue to consider. First of all, due to their extreme length, OTDR launch cables have a higher initial purchase cost, sometimes several hundred dollars each. Connector configuration also contributes to the cost factor due to the different connectors technicians may encounter during their OTDR testing, which would require a separate launch cable for each connector combination. When the OTDR launch cable does eventually wear out, the launch cable will need to be repaired. And while launch cable repair may not be expensive, there will be a few days where the technician would be without the launch cable, unable to do OTDR testing unless they have a spare. Finally, the launch cable can only be repaired so many times before it must be replaced. One method of making OTDR launch cables more economical is to include mating sleeves on the ends of the launch cable. Mating sleeves offer three economical advantages. First, the end faces are somewhat protected from the damage due to debris. Second, connector insertions are kept to a minimum. And third, adapter patch cables convert to whatever connector type is installed in the near end patch panel. On the other hand, there is one major disadvantage with using mating sleeves. The addition of a mating sleeve at the end of the launch cable produces an unwanted reflection point immediately prior to the near end of the link under test. This, in turn, results in additional dead zone for the OTDR to overcome, adversely affecting OTDR test results. So the technician has a choice to make between economy versus utility. Either add mating sleeves to a launch cable and deal with the additional dead zone caused by the additional reflection point on the OTDR test results, or use OTDR launch cables as they were intended resulting in proper OTDR measurements, with the understanding that launch cable costs will increase if connecting into various patch panel connector styles. There are three different OTDR launch cable configurations, each with its own set of advantages and disadvantages. It should be noted that all three different configurations have roughly the same initial purchase cost. The most common configuration is the traditional OTDR launch cable by itself, which we have learned is essentially an extremely long patch cable. While this method has the highest cost to purchase and maintain, it is also the preferred configuration from the standpoint of proper test results because it keeps dead zones to a minimum especially at the near end connection of the link under test, 
allowing for proper measurement of event attenuation and event reflectance. OWL fiber ring products are the equivalent of traditional OTDR launch cables. The next configuration takes a standard OTDR launch cable and adds mating sleeves onto each end, resulting in a female-to-female -female configuration. This is the configuration of OWL's Dead Zone box products. The obvious advantage here is that only one OTDR launch cable needs to be purchased initially, and short patch cables make the final connection to the OTDR and the link under test. The patch cables allow the technician to adapt to whatever connector types are needed, and are less expensive to replace when they wear out. The disadvantage to this configuration is that the final mating sleeve of the dead zone box produces a reflective event that effectively covers up the actual beginning of the link under test. Because of this, the near end connector cannot be measured for loss or reflectance. In fact, these two events will be too close together and will result in a multiple reflective event scenario where the event attenuation is roughly double what it should be. The dead zone at the beginning of the link under test is extended and only the reflectance of the most reflective event is considered. Since the reflections cannot be isolated, it is impossible to tell which of the two events is more reflective. Finally, a hybrid male-to-female configuration places a mating sleeve on only one end of a traditional OTDR launch cable, assuming that the male end of the launch cable matches the connector type of the OTDR port. This configuration is accomplished by placing a mating sleeve onto the end of an OWL fiber ring product. The advantage of this method is similar to the dead zone box, in other words, female to female configuration, where a short patch cable makes the final connection to the link under test, provided the near end patch panel is different from the end of the OTDR launch cable. Again, the disadvantage to this configuration is that the mating sleeve at the end of the OTDR launch cable produces a reflective event that combines with the reflective event at the beginning of the link under test, preventing the technician from separately measuring the loss or reflectance of the beginning of the link under test. These two events produce a multiple reflective scenario where the event attenuation is roughly double what it should be, the dead zone at the beginning of the link is under test is extended, and only the reflectance of the most reflective event is considered. Since these two reflections cannot be isolated, it is impossible to tell which of the two events is more reflective. In conclusion, the dead zone of an OTDR prevents the OTDR from detecting near-end events unless a long spool of fiber called a launch cable is inserted between the OTDR and the link under test. OTDR launch cables have the same cable and connector maintenance issues as standard patch cables, but due to their extreme length are very expensive to purchase and maintain. The optimal OTDR launch cable configuration for taking OTDR measurements is a male-to-male -male configuration such as OWL's OTDR fiber ring products although this configuration is also the most expensive from a maintenance standpoint. Other configurations are less expensive, but are also less optimal for proper measurement of loss and reflectance of near-end events. It is important for OTDR technicians to understand the issues surrounding OTDR launch cables in order to determine which OTDR launch cable configuration to use. This has been another instructional video from OWL, the wise choice in fiber optic test equipment. For more instructional videos, or to learn more about OWL's products in general, please visit owl-inc.com. I'm Professor Jim Powers. Thanks for watching.